What did you eat for breakfast? Nothing. Welcome to Music on Your Own Terms, the podcast that aims to help musicians develop an entrepreneurial mindset through interviews, as well as discussing resources, concepts, successes, and more. Providing a platform to talk about negative emotions such as anxiety and depression in order to help overcome them in the context of music and reduce the social stigma. This is episode 125. This episode is sponsored by Ignite Your Music Career. You may remember in episode 90, I chatted to Craig Dodge about sync licensing and how he makes a living through writing music for TV, video games, and film. Musicians all over the world subscribe to Ignite Your Music Career and earn more royalties, more upfront sync fees, and more recurring revenue from their music. Whether you're a composer, singer-songwriter, band, beatmaker, or instrumentalist, your music can be earning you more money. Internationally acclaimed composer, musician, and music educator Craig Dodge has licensed his music in more than 1,000 TV show episodes, films, video games, and ads all over the world, and he will show you how you can too. Ignite gives you the information you need in a simple, accessible format, and you learn at your own pace. For just $6 a month, you get a video lesson each week on topics related to music licensing, from writing techniques to how to find your markets, and everything in between. You also get tools and activities to build the skills you need to be successful, and each lesson includes a royalty-free sound pack to download and use in your own music. The key to success in the music business today is to diversify your sources of revenue. Ignite will show you how. For more information or to subscribe to Ignite, visit the website at taris-studios.com or click the link on musiconyourownterms.com. It is with great pleasure that I present my interview with the one and only Martin Atkins, drummer for Public Image Limited, Killing Joke, Ministry, his own band Pigface, entrepreneur, college lecturer, author, and international speaker. Martin talks about his journey from his dad getting him a drum kit and setting him up with gigs, the early punk scene and joining Pill, to noticing the mismanagement of the bands he was in and turning their finances around through merch. We learn about how Martin got into teaching students through his experiences with touring and the music business, writing books based on those classes, how that led to talking at music festivals, and the impetus of turning the collections of memorabilia from the past 40 plus years into a museum. We also find out how Ivor Bjornsson, guitarist for the Norwegian band Enslaved, taught Martin the importance of saying yes to everything. If you enjoy the podcast and want to show your support, I'd be really grateful if you would consider signing up for the mailing list to stay in the loop with everything going on with the show. Just head over to musiconyourownterms.com and click the link. While you're there, you can also visit the store and grab some merch, or just buy me a coffee and help out with the running costs of the show. Thanks for listening. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today, it's my great pleasure to welcome Mr. Martin Atkins. How are you doing, sir? Good, 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 good. A little bit tired today, but good. Awesome. I'm going to do a brief introduction, not that you need one, but Killing Joke, Public Image Limited, Nine Inch Nails, Ministry, you're a teacher, you have a record label, vast amount of history. So it's it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you. What I wanted to start off with is why did you get into teaching after this large historic amount of music that you you know being in the music industry touring you know what was it about teaching that started you off well so i've been doing this a lot lately Mm. just kind of refusing to to paint a picture other than what actually was right yeah so i got into teaching by accident i you know and it's great i tell my students like you uh, you don't know I didn't know what I wanted to do. I don't know if I, I don't know if I still do, you know, and I'm 61, but almost 18 years ago, I was putting together a pig face tour, you know, my band on my label. And we started to put these big package tours together, two and three mm. buses, five 
artists, videos in between the artists. We would do eighty to a hundred thousand promotional postcards. You know, I'm t- I mean, this is nearly twenty years ago, right? With ten different partners, we would have. 20,000 promotional CDs with tracks from all the artists, graphics embedded in there. So, I mean, and I'm looking at like mountains of stuff mm. to do for a tour. You've got to, once the, once the CDs are labeled for each show, because we didn't trust the venues to, to label the CDs correctly, mm-hmm. you know, it's just a lot of work. And I heard about interns, this thing called interns. I'm like, well, I could, I want, I want some interns, you know, I think it would be good experience for some kids to sit here in the office. They can overhear conversations while they're stuffing envelopes and labeling CDs and whatever. So I went to Columbia College, Chicago, which is like two, three miles up the street from me. And I did a presentation for them. Like, this is what we'll be doing. And this is a really serious thing. And I've been doing this Even then, I've been doing it for a long time, you know? Mm. And the faculty said, fantastic, when can you start? (laughs) And, and, And I actually said, I can take interns back to the office with me now. And they're like, no, when could you start teaching this? And I actually said, teaching what? Like, what are you talking about? And they said, you should, you should, you obviously know what you, you should teach this stuff. And I'm like, well, this is crazy. I had two kids at the time. I've got four now. And I remember thinking like a dad, you know, like, wow, this, what would I tell my, my kids to do? Like grasp opportunity. Mm. You don't know what the future holds, blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay, you know, what is, how long is a class? And they're like, well, seven hours. I'm like, oh, (laughs) okay. Uh, when do the classes start? Like maybe I've got like six months to prepare. Like they, they, they start on Saturday, you know, I'm like, well, this is ridiculous. And, and the craziest thing I could think to do was to say yes. And so I thought I was saying yes to the opportunity to teach. And I had to kind of uh, move some things around because we were about to go on tour, but that wasn't the opportunity. I walked into the first class and there's 25 students sitting there and I'm like, okay, well, what textbook are you using? And one of the kids hands me a book written in 1962, theoretical touring, blah, blah. blah. And I'm like, we can't, what the fuck? You know, <laughs> you, we can't, we can't use this book. And I'm like, and how dare you, you're paying, somebody's paying for this class. What, what are you consuming? You're prepared mm. to pay for a class with somebody teaching you. It was, if it was Shakespeare, fine you know we we knew a lot about Shakespeare in 1962 but this is a business of touring which keeps changing this is ridiculous so I started to bring my own materials into class and eventually put together my first book tour smart right which I thought that was the opportunity and it wasn't what happened after that was people started to ask me to speak Mm. so i've i've done 14 13 or 14 south by southwest in a row i've been to norway five times japan keynoted melbourne music week medellin colombia santiago chile like i've been all over i've been more places speaking than i've been drumming Mm. and that that was a really i know that's a long answer so the answer was it was all a fucking accident you know and if I was to say, well, it occurred to me that it was time for a pivotal shift, that would just be bullshit. Mm-hmm. And then anybody listening to this would start to think that this was all strategized and not accept that things are random and just to go with stuff. So, absolutely. So, there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just watched a video of an interview with you, and, and it was kind of the same thing. The interviewer asked you about being in PIL and there was something where you'd said that the the newspapers were talking about spilling jam on the carpet. And it's like, at that point, you were so, they, they were taking everything as like an artistic statement or you just right. spilt something. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and so I look at everything these days through the lens of teaching either my children or my students. 
mm. you know, and and somebody listening and and getting value from what they're hearing, not more nonsense. Like, how did my career start? How did I get into a band with Johnny Rock? It was crazy. Ooh, pinch me. It's like, no, no, no. Mm. It was 10 years. There was 10 years of work that went, you right. know, that went into that. And so I think the more people hear the truth, the better they are prepared to to deal with whatever's coming their way. Yeah, and 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 that speaks to kind of the punk aesthetic too. You know, you, you talked about the the rock star version where it's like if you want to play drums, you have to call a manager, whereas the punk is like, yeah, I'll play drums. It's like the the stripped down, no bullshit. You know, I really love that. Well, and and that that idea, that thread of of punk is still just massively in my life to this day the more we do stuff the less it's not that we're not scared but we just continue to do stuff right and make things happen and and it cre- it seems like fearlessness mm-hmm. but it isn't it's just action totally and I, w- I want to jump off what you said about just saying yes i did see a, a something you mentioned about how iva from enslaved taught you to always say yes but i couldn't find a story is that something you can elaborate on oh my god yeah first let me let me call myself out again so i was at a, an event in norway mm-hmm. and Ivor bjornsson was there and it was uh, I, did, I did one of my first speaking events was hole in the sky in in bergen norway mm-hmm. and it was i mean that's extreme black metal you know, and me you know and I think I was like I thought it would be funny just to threaten everybody. <laughs> um, so I, you know, but, but so I've, I've been over there for like five times, and at this one event, I, I actually felt myself being like a condescending asshole, and I thought, well, it was it was a a, a great Mexican dinner, and so I thought, okay, you know, I sat down I, I sat down at this table next to uh, Iva, and. Um, like oh you know and i remember thinking oh okay you know what's going on in black metal world you know d- whoa tell me what's interesting in your world you know and i was just thinking that, that i was gonna say well we did this black metal album or we did a black you know black metal this black metal that and he said um oh we just did this interesting thing and i'm sure i was like oh yes really what was that you know and he's like well we were hired by this composer to play in a harbor. I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting, you know, facing out to the sea. I'm like, okay. And as we played at high volume into the ocean, this composer had written music for the horns on a sailboat. Hmm. And as the sailboat came closer, our music clashed with the increasing volume of the horns from the sail. I'm like, oh, fucking hell, this fucking sounds amazing, you know? And I'm like, well, how how did this happen? And he just said to me, and he was like, knife and fork, you know, always say yes to everything. I'm like, fucking hell, I just got schooled, you know? And, awesome. uh, and so I put that in my slides, you know? I have some, you know, little kind of advice slides that I sometimes have mm-hmm. at the end of something else. And I think then... It probably took about two years of me going, always say yes to everything, telling that little story, but boom, for me to then actually listen to that, if if that makes sense. Absolutely. There's like a two-year lag. So mm-hmm. when I was in at South By, I used that slide when I did, there was one year I did South By Southwest Music and South By Southwest EDU, the educational conference, which is great because, you know, I say fuck a lot. And you drop a fuck at South by Southwest, nobody cares. You drop a fuck in an EDU conference and people, it's like you've slapped them in the face. So it was really good. And But I, I went out after my event, ended up meeting the mayor of Austin and some other people, get back to the hotel. And as I arrived back at the hotel, some people who were at my event were coming out and they're like, hey, it's you. We really liked your thing. Come and have dinner with us and I'm very shy I'm ridiculously shy and I'm remembering my own slide and I'm like yes you know but I'm all sweaty from running around all day let me just go and change my shirt real quick and and I'll be right back down 
and I could see the look in the guy's face. He was just like, ah, uh, okay, like never mind, you know. And he was half right because part of me, as soon as I got in the elevator, I pressed three wrong buttons, you know. Once I got into my room, I couldn't unfasten the buttons of my shirt. And I'm like, oh, my God, my unconscious mind is trying to divert me because it knows I'm shy to prevent me from having dinner with a bunch of people I don't know. I'm like, oh, my God. And once I realized it was going on, I was having this fight within myself. I get downstairs just as they were getting into a minivan, like, fuck this guy. And I jumped in the van. And they're like, oh, we didn't think you were coming. I'm like, well, I nearly didn't, you know. And uh, we end up going to some insane sushi place in Austin, which is like $100 uh, uh, for the set meal. And they're Canadian educators. Mm. And we start talking about the differences in the Canadian approach versus the American approach versus the English approach. And time just went like that. I mean, it's just a really great evening. And um, which I nearly prevented myself from having, you know. So, so yeah, thanks, Ivor. Mm, that's fantastic. Just going back to Enslaved, I, I've seen those guys twice. I love those guys. So being from England myself, I did want to find out, uh, I, I assume that you've been living in Chicago for quite some time. Why did you choose to emigrate and settle down in Chicago? I, I lived in New England for, you know, 18 years, but we right. got tired of the snow. That's why I'm in Texas now. Why the shift there and what prompted that? Well, I, I came to the States for the first time in 1980 with PIL on a, a, our first American tour and, you know, went back. We were over here for five or six weeks, went back to England, came back with my band, Brian Brain. You know, we played the Rat Skeller. I got into a fight with Gigi Allen at the Rat Skeller, and, mm -hmm. you know, so we'd come back and do these six weeks long tours like a lot, like three, four times a year. And uh, and then I came back in 82 or 83 and actually stayed here. Pill, Pill had moved to New York and asked me to rejoin in New York. So, I, I mean, I was on, I lived in Times Square, you know, New York City for, for a bit. Mm. Then 19th Street and 11th Avenue, which is unrecognizable now. Um, but the reason I, ca I, after a couple of years, every one of my friends pretty much, was somewhere in the States. And I would just spend my time calling people on the phone and mainly sending postcards to people and waiting for the next time to come over. So, and my band, my little three-piece punk outfit, Brian Brain, mm. we get anywhere from seven or $800 to $3,000 to play. In England, we were getting 70 pounds. You know, we get like five cases of beer, liters of spirits mm. and whatever when we played in the States. When we played in England, it was like three warm beers each, and you're lucky, you know. It's, which it, it didn't it, it didn't take any intelligence at right. all to just say, "Well, fuck this." So I moved to New York. I was in New York for a couple of years. Then uh, John uh, Lydon and and I moved to Los Angeles, where we lived for a couple of years before I left Pill. Lived in New Jersey for a while, and then came to Chicago in '89 fascinated by the industrial scene mm -hmm. which to me was just like the punk scene in london you know 77 78 79 where and i was in london for that and i was just drawn to the crazy fucking energy that was going on so i've been in chicago since 89 now that's awesome you have talked about your your dad got you a set of drums and I know that caused a little problem because you, you took it seriously and he wanted you to get a job. But why did you choose drums in the first place? Like, what did you ask him that you wanted them? Or was it because I think he's a, he was a musician or he is a musician? Is that, tr is that right? Well, he no, he, he passed like he passed like 10 years ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. He was a musician. He played trombone. But I mean, he wanted me to play drums. He bought me a drum kit when I was nine you know, help me mm. get my shit together, help me with a couple of auditions for, for some uh, bands, threw me into a situation in front of an audience when I was like 11. I thought I was going to play with this organist at a club and it was, it was a big kid's party. And I, I'm, I had no idea what was happening. And somebody, next thing you know, I'm on stage and this organist was, was pointing at me 
and this comedian comes on stage like a kid's clown comedian. He says, every time I fall over, hit the cymbal, snare drum cymbal, trap, bam. You know, next thing you know, I'm this mm-hmm. cabaret, <laughs> you know, uh, two years later, I'm backing strippers, you know, doing eight shows a week. Mm-hmm. And I, it got unexpectedly serious for me. So by the time I left school at the age of 16, I was doing eight shows a week. And I always had money in my pocket um, until I was in a bar, you know, and then I just had beer in my belly. And then I went down to London for some auditions because I was playing in one of the biggest bands in the north of England. And we were playing to 600 people when we played, you know, I'm like, oh, oh this is great. But what, you know, what, what's after this, this isn't going anywhere. And so I went down to London for some auditions. I read in the paper that uh, it, it said a drummer required for band with rather well-known singer. And I'm like, oh God, that's John's new band. And I called up Virgin Records. Hello. I'm like, oh my God, it is John's new thing. I'm like, okay, uh, I'm... I, 17, I think I was at the time. And I've been playing for 10 years. I'm your guy. I don't give a fuck, you know. And they're like, wow, you sound great. This was a Wednesday. They said the auditions are Friday. And I'm like, well, I need an audition today because I have to go back up to the north of England. I've run out of money. And they're like, well, the auditions are Friday. And I'm like, well, I can't, I can't, uh, there's nothing I can do. I've got to go home. I'm sure there was something in retrospect, there was something I could have, I don't know. And I knew as I headed back to the north of England, we lived in a place called Durham, just close to Newcastle. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, this is a big fucking mistake. You know, I, I was within inches of having an audition with this fucking Johnny Rotten. And almost immediately, I decided to leave the band I was in and move to London. I called them up. And um, I mean, thank goodness they said, well, uh, we're going to move to London. You're right. We're going to move to London as well. So we all moved together. Got a flat, a shitty flat together. All our equipment was in the van, so we had to take it in turns. Every fourth night, one of us would sleep across the seats. Like in the, it was crazy. So we were frightened of getting our equipment stolen. Mm-hmm. And then you know, it took a couple of years for Pill to go through six more drummers for me to get another chance. That's perseverance, though. Yeah. So I've heard you say that Killing Joke was when you kind of started jumping into the managerial role and and being really entrepreneurial in terms of the merchandising and all that stuff. But it does sound like that, you know, from an earlier age, you had that kind of drive. Can you can you kind of really pinpoint where that entrepreneurial drive stems from? Or is it kind of just common sense, really? Well, it's only common. You can only call it common sense if everybody you're with thinks points out these things true you know so so it's not common right if if nobody else is thinking it it isn't common Mm. so actually the first time i got kicked out of pil it was because i said on a a radio interview in san francisco that we were miss we weren't managing ourselves we were mismanaging ourselves i'm like we just played to ten thousand people we don't have any fucking t-shirts you know like we're just idiots really you know and we did a show every three days. I mean, God knows what the expense of that first tour was, you know. And we thought it was like, ha ha, fuck Warner Brothers. But we paid for all of it. Of course we did. Mm. So, so that I was surprised to hear that in this interview. I'm like, oh shit! I, even then, I was thinking, you know. But I remember when when it came to Killing Joke, when he arrived in London, one of this guy who was kind of looking after the band was like, oh God, you know, everything. Every step, there was a problem. I mean, I was like, I'm joining Killing Joke, but it was a mess. And um, this guy, Spike, was, um, he's like, yeah, uh, we can't rehearse next week because we need to get all the amps out of storage and we're behind on the storage bill. I'm like, what? Hmm. You know, and he said, and we need a bigger office. There's no money. And we need a bigger office because we, we've got all these T-shirts and these beautiful dead flexi discs. You can't move. I'm like, okay, hold on a minute. So I called up Greyhound Distribution, which is a distribution company we were working with from the States. I'm like, hey, do you send stuff over to the States as well as from? They're like, yeah. I'm like, do you want 500 flexi discs? I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm like, for a grand. All right. 
So we turned this big pile of flexi discs into a thousand pounds and we sold a bunch of t shirts. I'm like, okay, you know, just started to get involved in this stuff. And during the first tour, I started to see, I like to tell students this as well, I started to see how the business side, inattention on the business side, could affect the artistic delivery. Mm. And uh, I remember a club in Houston where my drum monitors were shit. I mean, they were terrible. And that can cause problems for my knees because I play so hard. If I can't hear myself, Mm -hmm. I'll play harder. So it wasn't me being an asshole. I'm just like, these monitors are shit. And then I asked them to turn on the house system so I could hear the reflection off the back wall at least. And the guy says, it's already on, mate. You know. And so mm. what had happened was the promoter got greedy. He wasn't being guided or policed by an agent or a manager. Uh, the ticket price was too high. And so instead of having, you know, 500 people at $20, that's 10 grand. You know, the ticket price should have been 12, you know. So we would have had 500 people at $12 a ticket. We might have had 600 people. But at 20, he had like 187, you know. So it was like, so he started to save money on everything he could. And I'm like, so just that bit of inattention and bullshit ruined a good night, you know. And if you're not careful and you do that 20 nights in a row, it could be the end of a band, you know. Somebody like loses their mind or loses their, loses a house or their credit or a relationship Mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, pushes themselves too hard and and gets into a vehicle accident all of this stuff you know i just started to see how these little things could make a big difference and i tell that story because there are still some people like oh no no i'm not interested in the business i'm all about the performance i'm like oh yeah okay then go and perform in your basement because it it's it's Mm -hmm. all poetry together you know where you get to do some interesting things, delight people, frighten them, manipulate them, uh, move them. You know, you put, all of this stuff needs to be correct, you know. Yeah, I mean, that reminds me of something else I, I, I saw the other day was you were talking about how it, it was another educational thing, not one uh, uh, Indie 101, but you'd said there should be thousands of people coming to this conference, not just like hundreds why Why do you think it is that artists tend not to want to do the artist side i mean what 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 do you think the psychology behind not taking care of yourself is it's an easy it's like me going oh i can't come out to dinner it's not shyness it's it's some other thing like it's much easier to pretend that being a one twentieth of one percent better on the base is going to make a difference. So you just lose yourself in the familiarity of the bass strings and hypnotize yourself and disappear up your own bum hole. You know, <laughs> the, the business stuff, it's never ending. It's constantly changing. It requires leaps of faith, long nights, early mornings, uh, and it's fucking constant. And I understand that it's frightening, but if you... If you say you want a career, then that's what it takes to get it. And while you're doing all of that, you need three or four jobs as well because the first one to seven years aren't going to pay you back. And that, that, I see artists all the time. Puh! We were asked if we play for free, and who do they think they are? It's like, yeah, your band isn't worth anything. You know, like your band isn't worth anything on a Tuesday and maybe not on a Saturday and you you played two weeks ago and people can see you whenever they want and who the fuck do you think you are right it's it's when you combine all of these skills and if you sell a song on stage theatrically moving into the spotlight you know doing the things that actors do it's just the same thing from a marketing angle choosing a slightly smaller venue choosing the opening artist carefully or choosing to be middle of the bill yourself, you know, being strategic about everything around your precious music, you know. And if you're not prepared to do all of that, then how precious is your music really? I'm going to call you out on that one. Totally. 
yeah, I, I, I really love the quote that you talked about how, how to how to fill a stadium with 20,000 people yeah. and all about relationships. Yeah. I think I'm going to name this ep- episode Unmuted Zombie Kittens, though. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> I did like that quote. I, I like that one too, yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, it makes total it makes total sense. You know, just there is no overnight success. It's hard slug, all about relationships, two friends a day for however long it takes. Yeah, and, and so it's it's just about adjusting your focus so how do you put twenty thousand people in the stadium i have no fucking clue no nobody has but can you make two friends today you know it means stop being an asshole start to work now put your base down and work on meeting people's skills i've had some great south by southwest with students who are like you know sometimes we're like listening to each other's playlists in the van Sometimes I'm listening to them talk and they'll be saying stuff in the seats behind me like, I'm really shy too. So I tried saying this to people and that seemed to work. Boom, boom, boom. Exchanging notes on how not to be shy. You know, I'm like, oh, this is fucking great. Mm. So if you learn that stuff, you'll get much further than, as I said, being slightly better on the base. Totally. Yeah. Let's move on to my main questions that I ask everyone. Okay. What significant negative experience have you overcome and what did that teach you? Uh, uh, Being in Public Image Limited was fucking PTSD, trauma. I don't mean to trivialize PTSD, but when you find, oh, and this is very much boo-hoo. Oh, poor Martin. (laughs) Because what I was about to say, which I will still say, (laughs) when you find yourself in a house in LA with a swimming pool and palm trees, and a hit single all over the world. <laughs> Violins. And you're like, it's everything you dreamed of as a kid, which actually was not that too long ago, right? I mean, mm. I had terrific success with Pill when I was, uh, was I tw- 18, 19 when I joined? 20 when I joined. So by the time I was 23, 24, it's gone all over the world. This is not a love song. A song that I co-wrote was a huge hit. Every Australia, Japan, I mean, and it took me about six months. I got kind of sick, and it took me about six months to realize it was the situation I was in that was making me ill. And, but, but my my mythology to that point is like, well, I'm in this. You're going to Tokyo. This must be great, isn't it? I'm like, yeah, you know. And it turned out it wasn't. And and. Uh, being in a band with John is not being around uh, some real dark, manipulative shit to the point where I just walked away from it. Mm-hmm. And when I rationally look at that, you know, with, with the benefit of 40 years, you think, well, there are some people, I mean, there are people still in that band, you know, and, I don't think anything that I went through is any better now than it was then. There are obviously people who are like, well, I'll just deal with that. That's the price of fame, Mm -hmm. you know. And I'm really kind of pleased, proud, whatever, that I just walked away from it because I needed to. And it wasn't until I was talking to Matt Pinfield, who's now a successful author. He was a radio DJ at WRSU in New Brunswick, New Jersey in 85. And um, I was at the Melody Bar in New Brunswick and this kid came up to me. He's like, you're Martin Atkins. I'm like, yes, I well, yes, I am. You know, and he's like, you, oh, you were mm. in public games. I'm like, yes. And you were a Miami Vice. Like, yeah, you co-wrote This Is Not A Love Song. I'm like, well, yes, I did, you know. Uh, wow, you know. And he said, and you left. I'm like, yeah, I quit the band. He's like, you fucking idiot. And, uh, it never occurred to me that I wouldn't just jump into another huge band, you know, and it was very difficult. I I have a, there's like a five minute story I did on it for NPR. I do a thing with Bob Boylan. It's called the Martin Atkins minute. I haven't done one in a couple of years, but I did one about the situation I found myself in after leaving pill. And that got very difficult, but you know, just like everything else, I tell that story 
My work permit was running out. I was kind of penniless. I was working construction with a fever, planting trees for Tico Torres from Bon Jovi, you know, who'd seen me play in the rain with This Is Not A Love Song on the radio. It's like, fucking hell, Is if there is a God, stop pissing on my head, you know. And I tell that story just because I know people, go, I went through that. I would love to have heard that story when I was going through it. And for the most part, you have people like Bono, etc. Just, it was crazy. It was a whirlwind and here we are playing stadiums. And Bono, Bauhaus, uh, we all slept on the same people's floors. Our friends in Boston, Anne-Marie Foley, who worked at Strawberries, let every band sleep on her floor, you know in her apartment. So we all came up the same way. And I think you share that information and and it's helpful. So I think I overcame that. You know, I've seen people turned lifelong bitter from similar shit, you know. Well, let me tell you what an asshole Johnny Rotten is, blah, blah. I don't have to tell anybody that. Everybody knows that. But I do caution my students anybody that will listen really but you know be careful what you wish for and success might not be what you think it is and think about it before you put what it takes and it takes a lot it took me a lot mm-hmm. to get to a point where i was in pill 10 10 plus years of working really hard so uh, i i think that helped me as a person i got drunk for a few years after that probably yeah that would be something i learned from that, that's awesome. And just to, to build off that, I, I obviously talk about mental health with the podcast a lot. And, and I think, uh, you know, that story, you know, as, as big as the band was, there's always something after. I mean, you, you said, you know, the, the books and the teaching has, have led to some, uh, you know, amazing opportunities. And maybe that quote unquote big break doesn't need to be the be all and end all because there's always going to be something after it. Right. You know, I think. We were encouraged back then to, you know, what's your idea of success? Number one in the billboard charts, top of the pops, number one. You know, that that's all we knew. Front cover of Melody Maker, number one on the hit parade, you know. And so that's what you're told all your life, you know. And turns out now you can be successful selling 500 albums, you know, if you put in the effort to do something interesting on the cover. Mm. You know, we, we do this stuff all the time. We, we have albums that sell for 60, 80 and a hundred dollars a piece because they're limited edition signed artwork. And, and it's like, well, you sell 500 copies of something that's a hundred dollars. It's 50 grand. Mm-hmm. Whereas I don't know how many albums or singles or streams or downloads you'd need from a major label to make anything because they spend so much money getting you to that point. You're probably losing money by getting some form of transient success that isn't really anyway. Right. For sure. What major positive experience has given you the push to follow this journey? Well, there's all kinds of things, you know, having children really like, I, I think, part of me restarting pig face in 2016 well it was the 25th anniversary of the band so i remember thinking if i don't do a 25th anniversary show i can't do a 27th anniversary show, you know <laughs> so i i just I, I wanted to do it but i also wanted my kids to see my four kids by then like this is what daddy does you know i think one of my kids has said to me So you're a teacher. I'm like, well, yeah, I am, but I'm also a fucking lunatic, you know. (laughs) So my kids, but also being sober, you know, I've I've had some stumbles for a while after my dad died, but I was 16 years sober. That helped. That maybe helped me grasp the opportunity of teaching. And teaching, you know, I hope that my students, most of my students get something out of being in a class with me. But the person who's gotten the most out of it, I know, is me. Mm -hmm. You know, when you when your job is to assimilate a bunch of information, think about your experiences, put it down in a in a a presentable, learnable, teachable way. Well, you're kind of 
loading your own memory banks. It's like a look. It's a luxury to be paid to dissect your experiences into a teachable form. Because I'm like, oh, you know, it's like, oh, you know, so that teaching, for sure, yeah, that's fantastic. One thing I did want to ask before we kind of wrap it up, I've I've had a couple of guys on. John Otway being one who's who's up almost up to his five thousandth gig. Do you, do you, have you kept records of how many gigs you've done? No, but I don't. I don't know that it will be five thousand. No, I, no. Mm. I mean, one of the things that frustrated me with Killing Joke, it would, you know, I just wanted to tour. You know, nineteen ninety one. I just wanted to tour, and um, there was a point at which I was in Killing Joke. I did ministry went back to Killing Joke, started Pig Face, and I was touring with Pig Face, and we started Murder, Inc. I mean, you know, mm. I was in it, and I wanted to be doing it. Uh, maybe a couple of thousand, you know. But if I include all of my eight shows a week as a 12-year-old, then maybe it's more. But there's there's a great site called Fodder Stomp, which has every PIL show, some of them with set lists. I know I have a sheet with all the Brian Brain shows. There might be 500 of those. So it's a lot, but it's not that many. Awesome. Oh, you know what I didn't ask you is about what got you into screen printing at home as opposed to, because obviously, you know, you, you have a record label and a, and a recording studio, so it's a no-brainer to be able to do that. But why did you decide, and I work for a screen printing company, so we do much okay. for bands, so there's... Right. You know, I'm very familiar with the business, but why did you decide to buy the equipment and do the work rather than just hire it out? Well, once again, <laughs> I could say, well, the cost benefit analysis mm -hmm. and the creative freedoms. But really, I was driving, <laughs> I was driving past the graveyard on Saint uh, on George's Road in New Brunswick, and there was this three huge piles of I didn't know what they were square wood squares oh my god and my friend uh paul hirsch i'd heard him talking about stretching canvas and for his paintings and it costs a lot of money i'm like mm -hmm. oh brilliant this will be great for him to stretch canvas on and i put i probably did two trips because it was close to my loft and i put all these uh i put all these what turned out to be screens mm -hmm. in, in my in my loft and um i didn't uh, so at some point, I bought some ink, and I started to make these shirts using a lot of the screens, because I didn't know how to make screens, but there was a police logo, a small police logo, the word security, like you would have on a t-shirt for security, plumbing, how, a running person that made it seem like a, a Atletico Spiz 80 logo, mm -hmm. the word fuck. A soccer ball, bowl, uh, a bowling uh, ball hitting three pins with like the little expressions coming up, and uh, the word happiness, which was like happiness is getting your lawns mowed by Steve's Lawn Mowing Company, right? And I masked everything off because I didn't know how to make screens, and then I made, I made these shirts for myself, and honestly, I mean, so you know about this mm -hmm. all over print using 20 different screens, 30 pulls per screen. I mean, you're talking about two days to make a, one shirt wow. of like constant working, right? Yep. And then I made some shirts just covered in the word fuck. I gave one to Mike Skasha that he wore with Ministry. I used to wear one. And I still got the shirt hanging up. And so after doing that for a while, I'm like, well, how can I get, these images, how do you do that, right? I read a book, because I don't think it was YouTube back then, about how to do this stuff, like using acetates from Kinko's copy shop. It's FedEx now. Mm -hmm. uh, you, so you make an acetate and expose the screen with a light bulb and a pie tin, you know. And uh, so I learned how to do that. And um, it was just crazy expression of being able to wear something different, you know. And then in 1986, I was talking to James Murphy last week, and he was my first intern in 1986 when he was 15 years old. And he's like, yeah, 
you had me printing some Japanese posters or something. And it was posters for Steve Albini's Rape Man performing. Mm -hmm. And I sent him a picture. I'm like, was it this? He's like, oh, fuck. Yeah. So and then we just started. I was able to print. It's kind of like supply chain disruption, really. Instead of having a thousand album jackets made for the first Invisible release, because we couldn't afford it, we could barely afford the vinyl in a 12-inch hole cut thing, die cut. I got some shopping bags from Uline, and I made a screen that said, Invisible, can you see it yet with the band names? And I screen printed the shopping bags as needed. Mm -hmm. So I didn't need the 100th shopping bag, you know, until I sold the first 80 albums, you know. So it was like it was this self-fueling, just-in-time manufacturing scenario. And I've I just I've kept on doing it ever since. I print new scenery for every tour that we do, posters. I did the Money Is Not Our God scenery for Killing Joke. And now I'm doing reprints using the original screen from 1990, signing, numbering, defacing with spray paint. And it's all of this activity that, that led to the, the formation of our new museum, which we just announced four weeks ago. Mm. So once again, fortuitous accidents, stumbling around in the dark, not dismissing anything and go, hello, ooh, what's this? Let's have a go. <laughs> like, you know, just fucking around. Sleeping with your uh, Mickey watch under the pillow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, actually, would, would you mind talking about the uh, museum and giving some background on that before we uh, finish up? Well, so th there's two things. I w please remind me to talk about these two things with the museum. One is the formation of it and the DIY punk aspect of it. And, and two is the museum itself. So two, for some reason, I've kept everything since 1972. Hand-typed itinerary from Virgin Records, instructions for us to meet at John's house to go to Paris. And we ended up recording the Paris of Prontons album there. It's my first gig. But hand-typed, crazily, you know, the, 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 the period went through the paper. I mean, just, you know, a ticket from the Paris Metro. Obviously, my drums, Paul Raven's bass rig, just the killing joke scenery, the pig face, 10 sets of pig face scenery, sheep on drugs scenery, test department. Uh, I made the, the, the scrims with all these hanging words for them that I hand glued paper letters onto mesh that looked really good. But then once the lights hit them and the shadows of the words formed across the bare chests of the oil drum banging guys in test department, like fucking hell. I still have all of this stuff. Um, so itineraries, contracts, unheard music, demos, monitor mixes from every band I've been in. Ridiculous. Wow. So handwritten lyrics from everybody, just ridiculous. Uh, from Trent, the original lyrics to Suck, to Genesis P. Orridge, Chris Connolly, Ogre, fucking everybody. Because when I produced in the studio, I would always ask the singer, well, give me the lyrics, and I would use that as a song map. Mm. Right before There Is No God Up In The Sky, I'm going to drop you in there, right? So I would just uh, accumulate all these lyrics. So it seemed like, as we did over 82 events in the last 14 months, connecting with people. I would reach into boxes for my next Killing Joke event or my pill event or my ministry memory event, just finding stuff. I'm like, holy shit, there's so much of this. I've got to do something with it. And of course, coffee table book would be easy. Mm -hmm. But what about to spread? It turns out the, the, the Fook backdrops the pig face fook backdrops were made by Tim Gore, who now does all of the Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's like ridiculously. He's this is signed, huge, twenty foot by twenty foot latex art. You know, I like just being around this stuff. It shouldn't be in boxes. It should be on walls, creating an environment that I can do screen printing workshops in about scenery mm -hmm. and point at stuff as I'm helping people make stuff and showing them how to shoot a screen to print a bag or a backdrop. But the other thing that's really interesting to me 
is I'm not some crazy confident person. I'm actually very shy. But it never occurred to me that I couldn't start a record label. I've had my label since 88. We've put out over 300 albums, some of which are fucking am- Swans, Test Department, Pig Face, Ogre, this, uh, Dead Voices on Air, Sheep on Drugs. There's some amazing Megaly Chin, amazing stuff on the, on the label I'm so fucking proud of. It never occurred to me that I shouldn't or couldn't be my own engineer in my own studio. I spent my life in studios to that point, but there's a difference between drinking and doing blow in a studio mm-hmm. and engineering somebody's album. It never occurred to me that I couldn't write a book or publish it myself and promote it around the country. And I love that it never occurred to me that I couldn't start a museum. And I want to sit in that museum and tell kids that very thing. Here's my report card. School failed me, although I failed everything at school. I have my master's degree now, and here I am opening a museum. We just announced it about four weeks ago with a way for people to jump in. It's called the Founders T-shirt. It's $125 fucking dollars for the Founders T-shirt. And you get a hand-type letter from me and a little pass because people said, I said, wear the shirt, it will get you into the event. And people said, well, we're never going to wear the shirt. We're so proud to be a founder of a museum. Could you do a little note? So, of course, I couldn't just do a note. I had to do this typewritten thing with a rubber stamp and two different colors of, you know. And then somebody saw a picture of me doing that. And they sent me an email saying, well, we're going to frame that letter, (laughs) the founder's letter. Could you do like a little pass? You know, so I'm like, so I'm doing these hand tight little passes for people, but we we have close to 300 people have committed to being founders. So there's like a an inner circle of support, and where some people might take the more logical approach of putting a business plan together, seeking funding, bum 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 bum, like yeah, fuck that, that never occurred to me. We launched it with a shirt. And, of course, I have the collection to put and the building to put the collection in. It wasn't like I was being cavalier or crazy. But I see so many people restrained by other people's expectations or their own expectations or their their insecurity. So they're going to follow the template how to start a museum. And I bought Museums 101, you know, and I've I have an advisory board of all kinds of people to like, what do you do when you've got five different things, like a bass guitar, the signed packets for the strings, the itinerary for that night, a recording of that. Like, what do you do with all this this stuff? It's not like four pages in a filing folder. So lots of people are helping. And just as Nike would say, we just did it. You know, we're just doing it and trying to always honor the people who jump in and help without question mm-hmm. and yeah it just it's just crazy that, that's killer it's when when do you think it'll be open to visit well I, that's that's the other thing some people are like is it going to be next year are you thinking i'm like no i think it's going to be next month <laughs> we're going to start to have meetings in the the 2000 square foot ground floor 14 foot ceilings it's just fucking perfect it used to be a funeral home it's just like oh the fuck trifecta you know so we're going to do some founders only events and then we'll start i'm going to do some workshops in there uh the screen printing workshop i can't wait to do in there we've been doing it online on zoom and it'll still be on zoom but there'll be people there with us Mm -hmm. so some soft opening events maybe towards the end of june meetings in a few weeks in the in the space with some of the pieces hung as we start to put the exhibits, the first set of exhibits together, the Rauschenberg uh, Museum in Florida is helping us. The Woody Guthrie Center in Tulsa is helping us. Lots of like professionals are helping us. And it, it's going to be super cool. I'm seeing these like, we might do a couple of pig face shows towards the end of the year. And I don't know what it will be like to say, hey, instead of meeting backstage, meet me at the museum tomorrow. 
yeah, I, I did these combinations of mm. of things are really interesting to me. That's fantastic. So the fi- the final question I always ask is, what does music mean to you? Well, I mean, you can say all kinds of things about music and and, and what specific music has meant to me at certain times, but what it's meant for me overall is it's been this magnificent tool to break down barriers, connect this shy English person with all kinds of crazy lunatics, Galen Lee, rappers and DJs and fucking Hank Shockley and all kinds of fucking people through music that I would never have spoken to even if I was in the same room, probably. So music has, has connected. It's been a connecting device for myself. It's been a shell-breaking device for me. It's been... Somebody said to me years ago, if you weren't a drummer, what would you be? And I was just like, in jail. <laughs> you know, it's been, it's been so much. It, it's been so much. But, but it's been this connecting device for me. It's connected me to the world. It's connected me to lots of people and deeply to individuals. It's been just glorious, really. It's and, and, and I'm seeing it now in full effect globally with Zoom. It's connected me to people that are, I'm still connected with people who were at shows in 1980 and we can reconnect again and share these memories. So mm. it's, it's been fucking glorious. Fantastic. Assuming someone can't use Google, where's the best place to... Uh, find you and reach out on the, on the internet. I'm going to have Molly send you my link tree link, okay. which has got everything in there, how to be involved in the museum. There's ways to get involved in the museum without buying a $125 shirt. People have been sending me cool stuff. One of the first chem lab, fuck art, let's kill shirts, a test department t-shirt from 1990 that was on tour with them. Cool stuff. But you can find me on Twitter I'm Martine, M-A-R-T-E-E-E-E, four E's uh, before the N. Follow me on Twitter, martinatkins.com. There's free downloads of my books up there. The newsletters go out through there. And as I said, I'll have Molly send you my link tree link to all this stuff. We're doing free events all the time, usually pay what you want events. I'm happy for people to show up and not pay. Uh, We're always doing something. That's fantastic. And then finally, at the end, I always play a song by the artist I'm interviewing. Oh, God. So what song would you like to play? Uh, well, I, I, I'll let you choose. There's, it's, it's a whole, almost feels like a cautionary tale. Uh, this is not a love song, Public Image Limited. Still their most successful song to date. Or Sunset Gone by The Damage Manual. Very proud of the drum kit that I recorded myself on a stereo microphone that sounds like Led Zeppelin on crack awesome yeah probably sunset gun i think good idea i think so well this has been a fantastic interview i really really appreciate your time and and sharing all this amazing information yeah i look forward to seeing you next next talk and uh keep doing what you're doing thank you so much for listening i'd really appreciate it if you would leave a review on itunes or your favorite podcast platform as this really helps get the word out about the podcast, so other musicians can benefit from the awesome knowledge that my guests are sharing. The more the musicians' community collectively learns, the stronger we will become. A rising tide lifts all ships. This episode is sponsored by the Skinny Armadillo Printing Company in Fort Worth, Texas, offering a full range of apparel decoration and promotional items, such as screen printing, embroidery, laser engraving, and much more. The Skinny Armadillo is now offering a merch fulfillment service including on-demand printing and a custom-built web store so you can concentrate on your music and running your business as a musician. Visit theskinnyarmadillo.com or call 817-546-1430 to learn how the Skinny Armadillo can help you take your merch to the next level. Keep pushing the needle and be excellent to each other. This is The Damage Manual with Sunset Gun.